started. Um, first of all, I want to thank Jim Cameron for that great presentation. That, thank you. Thank you. Um, what he was able to do was take data, information, and convert it into a story. And that's what you do as loan originators every day. You need to be able to tell a story and sell a story. And he's able, able to just very quickly understand our industry uh, very well. So great presentation, a lot of charts and graphs that tell a story, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Steve Resch is going to be joining us too in about, eh, about 20, 25 minutes. We'll see how quickly I can get through some of my content. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the first slide. Uh, this is selling Heckam loans using RV calculators. We have a few of them. We have a lot of acronyms. We're going to introduce you to a couple of them. And so what I'm going to format of today's presentation, I'm going to start by 20 to 25 minutes kind of giving you an overview of the modeling that you need to be able to do as a sales professional. Or if you're a manager, your loan originators need to be able to model certain things that in the past we didn't have to do. After that 20 to 25 minutes, we're going to talk about some scenarios. Uh, Steve and Far were kind enough to send me nine different borrower scenarios that were awesome. The kinds of things that you want to model for financial planning purposes. We narrowed it down to four really good couples that we thought would be good case studies to discuss and kind of model those in, in RBX and RBSA today. All right, we have two key systems that loan originators use. I don't think laser pointer is probably working, but you can see on the screen, we've got big screens for you. That's RVX. Most of you know that as reverse vision. We call it reverse vision exchange because we have a lot of software that we, we use here. Uh, RVX, reverse vision exchange, you'll recognize the pie chart. That's the loan screen. Most of you are already familiar with reverse vision exchange. Some of you are familiar with RVSA. Reverse Vision Sales Accelerator. We hear the acronym messed up a few times. It's RVSA, Reverse Vision Sales Accelerator. Now, that's your mobile tool. Now, historically, we've sold the reverse mortgage you know, through call centers or uh, even face-to-face, -face, but we've never really had to go to financial planner offices and model things. Now you can do this with your laptop, with your tablet, even your phone, if you bring your reader glasses for someone like me, um, then you can actually run models, you can run scenarios using your phone. That's great technology for you to have because you need to be mobile. You need to be able to model a scenario. Maybe they're not even giving you their date of birth. All we have is their age. Maybe they don't want to give you their full name. Maybe the financial planner says, all right, the woman's name is Kim. Let's run through a scenario. I'm not going to give you any information other than her date of uh, her her uh, age, not even the date of birth. Can we run models for that client? Absolutely, all day long. We don't. We can save it as a PDF, send it to the financial planner, send it to the realtor, and say, "This is what a reverse mortgage looks like. Is this attractive? At the time of closing, we'll show you um, a you know pie chart representing the reverse mortgage at closing, and then we'll show you a graph of what it should look like over time." based on some assumptions. So RVX and RVSA. Some of you um, may not use RVSA, that's fine. Some of you may not even use RVX. Kick back, relax. I think you're gonna enjoy some of the content regardless because there's talking points that will apply to the financial planning strategic uses of reverse mortgages. Let's take a little trip down memory lane since this marks the 10 year anniversary of my obsession with reverse mortgages. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about the way things were a long time ago. Who in this uh, room were originating or involved in the reverse mortgage space 10 years ago, 2008? Wow. So you might remember a few things about the industry back then. Does anybody remember the floor rate in 2008? Yes? 5.56. Yes, 5.56 because it rounded to 5.50. I'm not going to give you an award for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew you knew that. But uh, 5.56 really was the floor. It rounded to 5.5, which if you look at uh, HUD's PLF tables, you can look at historic PLF tables and see that they got actually quite a bit of money at 5.56 or less back in 2008. 
Does anybody remember, oops, let me click on the next slide. Yeah, the floor rate was 5.50 or really 5.56, <laughs> rounded down. Does anybody remember what the PLF was for a 62-year-old borrower in 2008? What were the principal limit factors? Anybody? It's got to be exact. <laughs> 62-year-olds, uh, this is not a timeline. I know there's a misconception about this chart that somehow it's over time you're going to run out of money. That's not the point. The point is, can you live off of 4% withdrawals? Yeah, probably for 24 years. Yeah, you should be able to be at, at 90%, which you see you are. The question is, if I have to live off more than $1,600 a month, is it going to last? Well, not likely if you need 5, 6, 7, 8%. Heaven forbid you need 10% of your portfolio distributed each year, adjusted for inflation. Your funds aren't going to last. But they have a, a much better chance of lasting with the other strategies. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that one. You can take the class. The class, I believe it takes about two hours. It's called Heckman Financial Planning and Sequence of Returns Risk. Heckman Financial Planning and Sequence of ret Returns Risk. It costs $99 to take. Um, yeah, there's a couple things in there that we haven't adjusted, the one and a quarter uh, in the training and video, but the concepts are there. The concepts are going to explain how to use this portion of the software, and then you can move forward from there. All right, I'm going to bring up Steve. Steve, come on up, and uh, I'm going to have Steve introduce himself while I, um, I was going to slide this over. Uh, can you hear me? Am I turned on? OK. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Resch. I'm uh, Vice President of Retirement Strategies at Finance of America Reverse. And uh, what I do is basically go around the country talking to loan originators and investment advisors and talk about the reverse mortgage HECM as a retirement planning tool. I am also a financial advisor. I started a wealth management company about 20 years ago. I've been managing money for over 30 years. Uh, and I've been using the reverse in my practice since the early 2000s, which is how I got excited about this industry. And, uh, so now today, I, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of my company anymore, but I'm still very much involved in strategizing for our advisors and uh, suggestions include incorporating home equity as part of the retirement plan. So I think what we're going to talk about today is a few scenarios that uh, I brought to Dan about real-life cases, and uh, he's going to model them for us. Excellent. And you know, Steve, you and I, Back when the studies first came out in 2012, maybe, right. we were working for the same company discussing these very yes, concepts. Sure. So it's kind of it's nice to be able to work with you again on something like this. So thank you for being uh, up here on the stage with us. And just to be clear, the faces and names have been changed to protect the applicants. Yes. <laughs> in case this gets out. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take a look at uh, four very nice couples that had uh, different stories to tell. And again, it gets to the heart of, we can look at the data, and we can look at a stack of application documents, but can we tell a story about what's going on with graphs and charts, uh, the same way Jim told a story about the industry? So, uh, Steve, you met with each one of these clients. Yes. Now, let's talk a little bit about Mike and Sharon. Why don't you tell us about Mike and Sharon? Okay, Mike, Mike and Sharon, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me as well. I spent the last 30 years living in Connecticut. And uh, many of my clients are in the Northeast. And uh, in the 30 years that I lived there, I lost probably 20% of the value of my home. Uh, we were in the Hartford area. And this is a huge concern of people in the Northeast because taxes are high, businesses and people are moving out. So we have properties that are stagnant and not appreciating. So Mike and uh, Sharon are clients of mine, and they also live in the Northeast. They have no intentions of leaving, but they are very concerned that they don't want to go 30 years down the road and find that their home just keeps losing more and more value. So we did talk about putting in a HECM as a risk management tool to protect, uh, or give them access to some equity no matter what happens to the value of the property should they need it down the road. So I think uh, we were going to model that and see how this would turn out. 
in a situation where there is no appreciation of the home value. Before we do, uh, Jim actually had a slide earlier that showed kind of a map of the U.S. and yes. talked about appreciation rates, and it ties in very nicely with this conversation because your area of Connecticut has seen significant declines in value. Absolutely, yeah. And there was a market watch uh, study. There was a market watch report that came out probably two years ago that uh, talked about all the states and when they would reach the pre-2008 real estate levels. And Connecticut was the only one that they said never. And that was a bit, uh, a bit disappointing to see. And uh, my wife was an originator, uh, reverse originator in Connecticut at the time. And I said, you need to go to every financial advisor in this state and tell them, put something in place to protect your client's real estate assets. So uh, that's, that's the backdrop. And that's so I, if you're going to stay in Connecticut, you better get a reverse mortgage quickly. Yes. Or, right? or any area, as you pointed out, uh, your map was very interesting, any area where you have concerns about property appreciating down the road. And not only those areas too, but as I said, 30 years is a long time. When you're planning a 30-year retirement, when I moved to Connecticut, the state was booming. It was booming, and I bought at the top of the market. We don't know what 30 years is going to bring, and it's not only with real estate, it's also investments. We all model for 4% distribution rates. Well, if I was living in Japan in 1989, and I was starting to take 4% out of the Nikkei every year, uh, in 20 years, I would be out of money. I'd run the numbers. It's horrifying. So we don't know what's going to happen with real estate or investments. Why not put something in place that you know is going to be there and grow and compound over time as a risk management tool? That's a great point. And you know, until last Friday, we thought the stock market was going to continue to <laughs> <laughs> grow about a thousand points every two weeks. Right. Right. And uh, of course, that's not a reality. That's not sustainable. Uh, the other comment I was going to make is the definition of a hedge is something is likely to go up when something else is likely to go down. Right. And so the borrower's retirement portfolio is estimated or expected to go down over time as they draw from it, right? Okay, but we have something that counters that. The line of credit, it's not just expected to grow, it's guaranteed to it's grow. guaranteed to grow. So that is the, just one other point, too, as far as the hedge, which you brought up. Uh, and I talked to my clients about this as well. It's also a hedge against rising interest rates. And what happens if we hit that five-point cap on our annual adjustable? Uh, I can pretty much guarantee that's definitely going to make a stagnant real estate level that not depreciate them. So you've got an opportunity to grow that line of credit even more while your real estate is flat or declining. That's great points. Excellent points. All right, so uh, this is our VSA run scenario tool, and you'll see that across the top you're saying scenario basics, and then you have all these other functions that you can add. When you click on it and it turns it blue, it adds another tab. It adds more functionality to your calculator. Now, in this case, all I really need to put in is home value. I mean, this is one of the easiest things to model. Right. But your comment was, yes, but it's the most powerful thing to Absolutely. model. Absolutely. Very powerful. Now, I'd like to have a race, although I don't have the fine motor skills, but I know some of our support staff could probably go through this and type in a scenario in less than five seconds. All they have to do is put in the home value, the margin's defaulted, you could change that if you want. Um, in this case, we put in 1% appreciation because that's what the client wanted to model. Uh, we can put in the borrower's age, although it defaults to 62, and if they have liens, then we can put that in, but uh, we find that many of the clients in this situation don't have any liens. Right. And so it's very easy to model. I didn't click on any other functions at this point. I don't need to. I only put in home value, age already defaulted, home appreciation, and then click calculate down at the bottom. Very quickly, I can tell a story. Now, we use the color green for the line of credit growth. I call it the magical green line. It was really impressive when it was growing at the interest rate <laughs> plus one and a quarter. Uh, but again, we don't need that impressive growth to accomplish our goals, but take a look at this, 1% growth. Uh, Steve and I are looking at the same screen you are. 1% growth is not a lot model, and yet our line of credit at some point is expected to exceed the value of the home. Wow, that's great. All right, so um, the blue, by the way, is the home's value. The red is the loan balance. The loan balance is really just the closing costs, and it's defaulted there for you, although we can customize the fees and make it more accurate with your fee schedules and fee templates. But um, 
One of the things that I wanted to mention is take a look at the difference between the blue line and the red line. That's the borrower's equity position at any given time. Now, I was given license to talk about the CFPB, the old CFPB. <laughs> that, um, I was given license, and don't quote me, Liz, uh, on this one in Reverse Mortgage Daily. But uh, I was given license to, hey, if you want to talk about the CFPB and the way they view us, go ahead. Um, if you look, if you do a search for a reverse, uh, reverse mortgage at CF, CFPB's website, the very first paragraph will tell you that as your loan balance rises, your equity decreases. Really? I've looked at a lot of the amortization schedules, and you know what? More and more, we're seeing amortization schedules where borrowers are gaining equity. That's right. Yes, amen. <laughs> so we're seeing, in this case, we're only modeling 1% growth. And the interest rate plus the MI is over five times that rate. And here's why this is an important discussion, because even some of us in our marketing materials say it's a rising debt falling equity situation, or they say it erodes home equity or eats away at home equity. Well, it depends. The major component of someone's home equity is what's the house going to do? That is the major component of whether you're going to see home value appreciation or not, or equity um, increases. So um, we got in this discussion about this chart, and I told Steve a story about sitting across from the kitchen table from a client and his heir who was looking for any reason not to do the reverse mortgage. And he was a very uh, irritated with me. I'm not a high pressure sales guy, I'm an educator. But um, he clearly wanted to make me look bad. So he called me an idiot. Some of you who have taken my classes know that I tell this story. He called me an idiot, and I said, well, Tell me, what, um, what makes you think I'm crazy here? Well, you're modeling 4% growth for my dad's house. Well, what do you think it will grow at? Well, it's not going to grow. It's going to depreciate. Have you seen my dad's house? <laughs> well, yeah, I've seen his house. So we were actually in a restaurant. But I've seen his dad's house. And he said, this home will depreciate. I said, well, then by all means, we should model that. He's making a case for a reverse mortgage right there. So can we model that? Yes, we can. You can model 4% depreciation, up to 4% in RVSA. Now, let's examine that chart again. Error. Let's take a look. Well, I suggest you get a reverse mortgage today. Do not delay. <laughs> Do not wait. Get a reverse mortgage. If you think there's a chance your home will depreciate, by all means, lock in that line of credit now. So do you have clients that even talk about depreciation? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's a major concern. And then uh, one thing, too, about your red line here, uh, which is nice about the graph and chart, is that you can see the relationship of the cost to get the loan versus the potential equity or available line of credit. And you can see over time it's absolutely minimal. And many clients are used to paying what I call the, the premium for this risk protection, uh, which is actually your closing costs. They're paying these dollars amounts every two, three years in life insurance policies or long-term care policies. So in this instance, they have a one-time quote premium to put in place a risk protection program that's going to, as you say, be guaranteed to grow. And again, looking at over time, it really is minimal based on the value that they are. It's a great explanation from a guy who has experience in financial planning. That's a great explanation for the client. Excellent. All right, so uh, if that happens, if you have a client that says, well, I think the home's going to appreciate at 8%, well, great. We're going to see uh, increasing equity over time. If they say it's going to depreciate, well, that's a, that's a reason to do the reverse mortgage. It's a very urgent reason to do a reverse mortgage. That's the lesson to be learned by our first case. By the way, this isn't just RVSA. In RVX, you can model this all day long. It's in the, uh, the loan screen, right-hand side. By the way, ATC, those are three critical documents you want to be familiar with. Amortization schedule, the TAL for total annual loan cost disclosure, and the comparison. And you can pull those up very quickly without generating a doc package just by clicking on A, T, or C. Click on the A and find out, is the borrower losing equity? And what do I want to model? Do I want to model property appreciation of 4%? or a little bit lower, a little bit higher, customize it so that you make the borrower feel comfortable that you're not crazy. Right. All right. Shall we move on to Chris and Anna? They seem like a fun couple. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about Chris and Anna? 
All right, Chris and Anna are uh, 63 years old, and uh, they are getting ready to retire, and they have um, assets, they have uh, pensions that will be coming, Social Security, so we've done an income analysis. They have enough money to meet their uh, spending needs, but they do not have a long-term care plan in place. Um, not that I haven't talked to them about it for 20 years, but it's like <laughs> sometimes people just don't hear until all of a sudden it's right in front of them. And the question to me was, what are we going to do to protect against long-term care? Okay. Well, we have a couple choices. We can look at purchasing a policy, or we can look at uh, setting aside your home equity and saying your home is going to be your long-term care plan. So what we wanted to do, and what Dan uh, modeled here, is examine the costs involved, whether they purchase a policy, which in this case would have been a life insurance policy of a $300,000 death benefit, which could also be converted to a long-term care benefit. So they could take that $300,000 if they needed it. Or just using home equity, and we wanted to see the difference between the cost and the, the benefit. That's a great thing to model. Um, and I'm guessing you, when you have conversations with your clients, the number one concern is running out of money. Mm -hmm. What they're going to do with their long-term care is pretty high on the list. Right. We can address both of those. Right. All right, so of course in this case the objective is to compare the costs and we can do that. Uh, $300,000 life insurance plan with a long-term care rider and it's going to cost them $8,038 per year. Per year. How are we going to pay for that? Um, that would not work with their cash flow projections. That was the number one issue. And so they're not not—they're not even looking at this Correct. as an option. Or using the home to finance it, one or the other. They could not take that out of their projected household cash flow. Uh, well, I did have some questions for you, Steve. In your experience, you've kind of indicated to me that proper in-home care provides everything they need right. that they would normally get in long-term care. Right. So the issue here for Chris and Anna is they want to stay in their home, right? They absolutely want to stay in their home no matter what. So and, and there are you know, a lot of situations where clients will say they want to move on and go into their home, but that's normally the case when there's only one surviving spouse. I rarely see two surviving uh, or a live couple where one says, I want to go into a nursing home. It's usually the last one. So in that case, we could always liquidate the home to help on uh, the long-term care for the last surviving spouse. Right, and we need to make a distinguished uh, term care and in-home care. If they're going to maintain the HEC and if they want to keep the HEC, then they have those occupancy requirements. Absolutely. So that's a discussion that, of course, a financial planner would have. What, where do you want to live? Absolutely. And that may determine our strategy with the client. So let's go ahead and model both of these. Um, one other comment I had for you, and I have for the rest of the crowd here, how in the world are we not tied at the hip with in-home care providers? How in the world are we not interacting with in-home care providers? And I know some of you are writing that down right now, and hey, it's a great idea. <laughs> the, the story I have is I was, uh, in, in fact, it was a year ago, I was flying from Orlando to this event, and uh, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was coming from a funeral. And so I was just kind of sitting off by myself, but of course the couple next to me had to start talking. And um, I said, well, what, what's bringing you to San Diego? Well, they're here for a conference to talk about aging in place and how to help people stay in their homes. And I was thinking, oh, they're going to UserCon, right? right. <laughs> they weren't. Turns out they were coming to San Diego to talk about in-home care best practices. They were the largest in-home care network in Central Florida. They own it. This couple owns it. And I said, what's your major challenge? Funding. How do they get the money? Well, the house can pay for it. The house can pay for in-home care if we've structured it properly. And I said, don't you think it'd be a good idea for me to, or someone else in the industry to go talk to your board of directors and make sure this is an initiative? If your number one problem is, how do the clients pay for in-home care, wouldn't it make sense that the easiest solution is highlighted in all of their training? And it's not. So I'm sitting on a flight with this couple and um, I'm reading Southwest Magazine, there was an ad for an in-home care provider, national uh, franchise. So I ripped it out of the magazine, I walked back a few rows and I said, hey Peter, is this a competitor of yours? They go, oh yeah, they're really moving into our market. And I said, would it make sense for me to talk to their board of directors? 
Would it make <laughs> would I want to talk to uh, some of their leadership, their executive team? Would that make sense? Like, no, 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 no. Don't talk to them. <laughs> that was the response. So clearly, they see the benefit, but we're not getting the traction with the executives and in-home care franchises. I think it's a great market for you guys. So write that one down. I think it'd be a great way to generate some business. So let's take a look at the modeling for this one. So you can see that I clicked on the periodic draws button. I turned that blue. What that did is it added a tab called periodic draws. And uh, that adds more functionality. I have all the basic information in there already for this couple. And so the question is, would you like to model draws from your line of credit? Well, the answer is yes. That's actually the second question. The first one, do you want to take a lump sum? No. I don't want a lump sum. I want regular draws from my line of credit. The question then is, well, when do you want to start? When do you want to stop? How often do you want to make draws? And for how much? Well, in this case, I put, well, let's start next month. That's zero years in one month. I want to stop in 20 years. Now, you mentioned 20 years puts them kind of in a sweet spot. Right. Exactly. Into the early 80s, that's kind of when you are hitting the uh, time frame when you may start to need some long-term care assistance. And the statistics bear out you're not going to need in-home care for 20 years. Correct. So we'll talk about condensing it to a term instead of a 10-year. We'll talk about that here in a moment. All right, so we're going to extend that out 20 years. We want annual distributions to pay the annual policy in a specific amount of exactly $8,038. Can we model that? Absolutely, and here's what it looks like. So we find out by looking at the amortization schedule that the net cost of the policy after 20 years is $337,000 and growing. But there's one caveat there that you pointed out. Now, wait a second, the line of credit's growing too. Yes. So you explained to me that when you look at the benefit to the client, you have to look at both death policy. benefit as well as the available line of credit. Death benefit, long-term care rider, of course, Correct. and I'm sorry, death benefit, and and, and the line of credit growth. Correct. And you had meant you had um, talked about that you're you're buying coverage in this case of five hundred and seventeen thousand dollars, not three hundred. Correct. Great way for a financial planner to think about it is we just increased their coverage from three hundred thousand to five hundred and seventeen thousand, right? By using this strategy, right? Now it's costly. Clearly, it's costly. So let's take a look at option number two. In this case, the reverse mortgage is the policy. In option one, we were funding the policy. In option two, it is the policy. Correct. So all we need to do is go to LOC conversion. And let's look out 20 years and let's convert that thing. Okay, so naturally it will convert to a 10-year. It doesn't have to be that way, but we're going to say, let's just start receiving payments. In 20 years, we're going to take that line of credit, convert it into monthly cash flow, and see if that helps us out a little bit. Before you convert it, Dan, what is that line of credit in 20 years? I think it was just over 500000 Right. So point being, it's actually about the same amount of benefit, if you look at the equity of benefit, as the uh, $300,000 life insurance policy plus the available line of credit there, only the cost is extremely different. Let's find out. Okay. <laughs> I'm jumping in. And there you go. <laughs> Too exciting. Uh, but yeah, look at the long-term costs of this. Uh, really, it was just the closing costs compounding at about 5%. Yeah, it's the closing costs are getting bigger. Now, the costs don't really start going up until we convert that into funds that they need. Right. So, yeah, we're looking at five, let's see in my notes, was it just over? It was about the same, five, five and a quarter, I think. We're yeah, right. it's a little over $500,000 in line of credit, guaranteed as long as they occupy the home and abide by program guidelines. Okay, but the total cost after 20 years was $51,000. Right. A lot cheaper. A lot cheaper to go with option number two. Now, there's some caveats that we talked about, Steve. Mm -hmm. If they already have a policy, right? So it, it's a little different. And you said Wade Fowl has actually addressed this as well. Yes, it, um, he has said, and I agree with this 100%. If you have an existing policy, you're not going to give up an existing policy. 
when it comes to retiring this couple, for example, um, and they're deciding between one or the other, I would recommend just <coughs> setting aside the equity. I would not recommend starting a policy unless it is in their plan that they want to be able to have something that's transferable and go with them someplace else. Um, so again, if they've got something already in place, Maybe it makes sense to use the home equity to continue those payments so that they're not going to give up something that they've already built value into. But to start at this point when you've got no coverage at all, I would suggest using the home equity uh, in all things being equal. Option number two. Right. Okay, great. However, if we convert this to a tenure, by the way, you can see it looks like a slope from age 82 to 83. It's actually at one point in time, it's just we're putting year-end figures in the graph. Okay, so it's actually, we're taking that, all that line of credit and converting it over here to a 10-year payment stream. By the way, that cost them $20 to do in servicing, to shift this over to a 10-year payment. If they shift it right back, they're gonna get that line of credit again they're going to shift it. They can. They can shift it back to a line of credit. They can go with a modified tenure, modified term. Uh, they have flexible options if they need to change their payment stream. Right. If, if it turns out that they really need in-home care and it's going to cost them 12000 can you do that? Yeah. It's just we're going to have to reduce the term in which they, they we set up. Right. $20 every time you change this in servicing. That's a great value. All right. So. $3,700 in a 10-year payment is really not going very far on a monthly basis. But we address, you don't need that for 20 years, or you don't need that to age 100. It's calculated to age 100. In-home care is not needed for that length of time. It'd be very rare. Right. So I think it averages four years for four, in four and a half. Four, four and a half years for in-home care. So uh, I, we talked about a client I had in Miami who said, man, if I live another five years, it'll be a miracle. I said, well, you want to go with a six-year term, seven-year term? Dan, you're not listening to me. I will not live another five years. And she's okay with that. So let's maximize what she can get for five years. She said, let's set it at five. So let's take a look at what happens when we decide to go with $6,000 for eight years, or $7,000 for seven years, or $8,000 for six years. You can customize this to meet their needs. How much are we getting from other retirement sources? That'll help us determine whether it's going to pay for in-home care or, uh, or whatever else. So pretty good model here. So the question is, and we've kind of addressed this already, Steve. Would you rather have the heck of pay for the policy or the heck of be the policy? You kind of said generally be the policy. Again, if, if it's a situation of choosing one or the other, um, I do have I do have clients as well who have had situations where we have policies in place and we want to keep those and we also want to supplement and consider the home equity as well. So it can be a combination. You just have to look at every single situation. But the point being, you have to incorporate, or I think it makes sense to incorporate home equity into your long-term care planning um, solution. Steve, some of the most devastating financial planning stories I've heard are cases where they stopped making their insurance premium payment. Yes, uh, and that's, that is really in the traditional long-term care plan. Uh, and I know <clears throat> my parents were in that exact same situation. They each had long-term care policies that they got in their early 50s. And twice there were um, rate class premium increases where the premiums doubled. Uh, fortunately, they could continue making those payments, but if they couldn't, they would have lost everything that they had put into those plans. So a lot of financial advisors are steering away from a traditional long-term care plan, and they are going to what we discussed, a life insurance policy that has a long-term care benefit rider. And those are great uh, because you've got a guaranteed benefit, but what I don't like about them is the, the uh, inflation feature that you had with traditional long-term care plans where they would build, you could choose a rate where they would continue to appreciate. And that's why I like incorporating it with the HECM line of credit because you have that built-in inflation feature as well. Right. So we were talking before, we had a guaranteed death benefit, 300000 from day one, or 30 years down the road, it's still 300000 But when you incorporate that with a line of credit, that line of credit is growing, and that can increase that available benefit to you. Great point. Excellent. One of the things I wanted to mention is some of you are asking, what's that dotted green line on there? That is the continued line of credit growth with no action. 
So we don't know if they're going to need in-home care or not. Right. There's a good chance they won't need it. In fact, there's a chance they're going to live a very long time. Well, we want to know, what does that line of credit look like over time if no decision is made to change that or convert that in any way? If no LOC conversion takes place, there's your dotted green line. Let's talk about Jerry and Betty. You want to tell us about this couple? Jerry and Betty, um, great couple, uh, 73 years old. And Jerry and Betty actually um, made a very smart investment decision in 1986. They bought 100 shares of Microsoft when it went public, and they paid $2,800 for that. Uh, their Microsoft stock today is worth $2.5 million. <laughs> And that's only because they have been spending the dividends. If they hadn't spent the dividends, that stock would be worth about $5 million. But in any event, they spend the dividends, the stock is worth $2.5 million. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. Hold on a second. Is everybody listening to this? <laughs> Does the media know this? That Jerry and Betty have $2.5 million, Steve. Right. And they're getting a reverse mortgage? Yes. <laughs> Are these needs-based borrowers? Not at all. Are they desperate? Not at all. Are they preventing foreclosure or bankruptcy? Not at all. Okay, well, I think the media needs to know this, that Jerry and Betty have a very good reason to get a reverse mortgage. We're managing taxes here. Because um, pretty much if they sold, they need some extra money. They want to do about a $50,000 renovation or update to their home, and they want some extra cash flow every month. Um, so the question is, do you sell this low-cost basis asset and pay capital gains tax on it? Or, my suggestion to them was, you know, when you die, and they want their children to have this, uh, this stock, and I said, when you die, if you died tomorrow, your children would inherit this at the $2.5 million value. That would be their new cost basis. That's a uh, stepped-up death benefit. So we want to retain the stock for as long as we can, and find funding sources elsewhere. So we looked at a reverse mortgage where we can take out home equity, it's not taxable as income, and we're leveraging the home to meet the income needs that they have while preserving this taxable asset for another generation. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. So you're telling me their cost basis was 2800 Right. So all of it is capital gains. All of it is. But it won't be for their children when their children inherit it. Is everybody following that? This is a great story to be told. In fact, why, why when the children inherit it, you mean? It's a stepped up death benefit. So the children will have a new cost basis based on the value of the stock at the date that they inherit it. Brilliant. I think so that's a great sold story. sold the next day, they would pay no capital gains on it. That's an amazing story to tell. All right, in fact, I'll actually read you the notes that I said when you sent this case over to me. I said, wow, in all caps, exclamation point. This is a perfect case highlighting the benefits of the Heckin product for those with a well-funded retirement. These stories need to be told. They have a well-funded retirement. They're clearly not desperate. They're not needs-based borrowers. They're doing it because of, the tax, um, because of the tax consequences. Brilliant. Sure, yeah. Now, Steve, most people would be inclined to sell the investment without your advice or with the advice of a confident financial planner. That would be their thought, their initial thought. Conventional wisdom, right. sell the stock. And, and again, we looked at the long-term benefit of hanging on to this. We looked at the cost of selling it and paying the taxes on it and giving up the long-term potential growth. And uh, we decided this is the best. And without your guidance, the heirs are going to assume the same. Sure. Great story to be told here, so we can model this. Of course we can model this with RVSA. I've already got the home value, I've already got the age. In this case, now I didn't highlight it for you, I'm going to click on the periodic draws tab. And once you click on that, you're going to see some questions here. Um, yes, I'd like to take a lump sum. I'd like to take $50,000 in about six months, I projected, because we were going to do that repair to the home. So I put, yes, I would like a lump sum in six months of a specific amount of $50,000. Very easy to model. But there's more. Would you like to take draws from your line of credit? Absolutely. They want a stream of cash flow coming right. in. They're going to consume their home equity over time uh, with systematic draws. And we're going to start making that in, in zero years and one month. Basically, next month, we're going to begin taking draws. 
and it's going to continue until they're age 100. Right. 27 years in one month. How often would you like it? Monthly. In a specific amount, $750. That's all it takes to model this, uh, what seems like a fairly complex scenario, but it's not. It's just periodic draws, a lump sum, and future draws, and this is what it looks like. Now that first year, you're going to see a drop in the line of credit. You're going to see a rise in the loan balance. They just took $50,000. But then we look over time, it actually isn't projected to eat all of their equity. They're taking $750 a month until, uh, well, actually, uh, their line of credit is exhausted at about age 96, mm -hmm. but they still have equity left. Right. Great story to tell. All right, so the question I had for you, if tax laws continue to evolve over time, uh, and I got to thinking about this after our, our initial call, this gives them the flexibility that they could liquidate sure. investments if interest rates go through the roof sure. and they want to, or the tax laws change, which right. lessens the capital gains right. impact on them. They're not locked into anything, but for today and now, it makes sense. It's a great plan, probably needs to be revisited sure. over time. All right. Let's talk about Alex and Sarah. Why don't you tell us about this couple? Oh, this, oh yeah, okay. I'm still getting used to these names we made up for. <laughs> and faces. And, and faces. But nothing quite matches, so all right, this couple. Um, this, uh, this is a couple, they're 62, uh, and I have a lot of clients in the early 60s, and they're anticipating working until age 70. I mean, that's just going to be a fact. We are extending our working years. But they're eligible for a HECM at this point in time, and they're rolling into their 60s with a loan balance. So my um, strategy to them is let's convert this now to a HECM and continue making payments for as long as you're working. And then you're building that line of credit so that at age 70, when you decide to not work any longer, then we've got a pool of reserves that we can draw from if we need to. Uh, and with the changes in the uh, program, I think interest rates are much more competitive now with traditional forward loans. And again, I've talked to a lot of financial advisors. They actually like these changes. They like that this loan is competitive now with a forward product. So it's a much easier sell, as far as financial advisors are concerned, uh, to make this conversion now. So in this case, um, they want to continue uh, making payments into the loan for seven years. And then at that point in time, they want the home to actually pay for itself. And we estimated about $7,000 a year to pay for the property taxes, the insurance, and uh, any maintenance and repairs set aside. So they want to pay in for seven years and then start drawing out $7,000 a month or $7,000 a year for as long as they can. And they wanted to see how that would model out. And of course, we can do that. Um, now, we're, you mentioned that you we're seeing younger borrowers. We're seeing younger borrowers at age 62 um, that are still in the workforce. They should be making payments, even Absolutely. if they get a reverse mortgage. If they have the ability, they should because it gives them future security. Right. And that's historically, that prepayments or partial payments has not been something we've discussed with clients, but we're finding more and more, this is the most popular feature of the Run Scenario tool, right. is showing them the advantages of making payments. Now, I mentioned earlier why we should be selling a few more fixed rate loans. On the HECM for purchase, it's already dominated by the fixed rate product. I believe we should be selling more ARM products for this very reason. If you're doing a HECM for purchase for someone in their early 60s that's still in the workforce, show them the ARM product and say, would you like to make payments? Well, I, I was told I didn't have to. Well, no, you don't have to. Well, you were making $2,000 payments. Why don't you make $3,000 quarterly? Okay, it's a lot easier of a, of a burden on them, and it gives them future security. So more and more, we have borrowers that are asking the question, what are the advantages of making prepayments? Well, let's take a look. So we're going to actually use two strategies at the same time here. We're talking about partial payments. When would you like to make them? Right away. Continue for, and I put eight years, uh, age 62 to no, 70. Sorry. Um, but, uh, we want to make monthly payments. Now, not everybody's going to make monthly payments. Isn't that a little bit of a hassle? It's not like there's a payment coupon we can send in. It's, um, but are they going to make quarterly payments? We see a lot of that. Are they going to do it once a year and see the strategic advantages of that? Absolutely. But in this case, let's model monthly for $1,500 as the client wanted. 
And then let's talk about periodic draws in eight years, and we're going to stop in 38 years, and we're going to take annual distributions of a specific amount of about $7,000. And your reaction was, well, I don't know exactly until we model this right. whether that's sustainable or not. Well, let's take a look at it. And here we go. Um, the dotted green line is, of course, no uh, distributions at right. age 70. But uh, let's take a look at We see the loan balance dropping to nearly zero. Right. By the way, they do not want to pay their loan balance off. In fact, I believe Hermit's threshold is 50 bucks. 50 yeah. You've got to make sure they keep that in or that magical green line goes away. So I know uh, we would love to see HUD uh, or FHA have bells and whistles go off that, hey, if somebody's about to pay this off and it's not because they died, right. uh, then we probably need to be very careful. Make sure they do not pay off the reverse mortgage completely or they miss out on that line of credit growth. So we're going to pay it down to $100. In our BSA, we model it. At, it stops at $100 loan balance. Okay, but obviously that line of credit is growing during that time. Well, check that out. They're taking $7,000 annually, and the line of credit still grows.